Hey everybody, you're probably keen to get to the secrets in the content, but I just want to say it's great to be able to help people turn their lives around, so thank you for giving me another opportunity to do what I do by listening and watching this video. So however you've ended up here, whether it was through a Google search or Z Talks on YouTube or Facebook, or as a Facebook friend of mine, you're most likely in the right place. We can safely assume you're kind of an intelligent, insightful person who wants to make something of themselves. Maybe a little bit creative, maybe a bit shy. You're probably the kind of person who's very sensitive to energy and other people's emotions. You might even identify as a bit of an empath. But you probably have, or had, some dysfunctional relationships. And maybe because you haven't really worked out boundaries and how to navigate that stuff, but that's something I can help you with, so never fear. I'm a recovering people pleaser myself, and now I know exactly how to manage my energy in social and family interactions. So, there's one reason that people are looking to invest time and money into self-improvement, and it's the recognition that perhaps we aren't up to the standards that we idealize for ourselves, so there's actually two ways to deal with this. You can either lower your expectations and accept that things are the way they are, or you can raise your skill set and become the person you are hoping to be. This and most of my methods are focusing on the latter. I think a lot of people try a few things and give up and start accepting things in a bad way rather than the body posy reframing, silver lining kind of way which are all awesome things that I use and you will use after following and working with me. But the resignation of accepting things as in the, that's a bit of pill to swallow, compared to, okay, I accept and love myself as I am, I am worthy of love. They're two completely different things. If by the end of this video, and maybe you watch a few other videos of mine, and you're just able to accept yourself and feel better and lower your expectations, well, all the best. I hope you don't have to invest any more time and money in the search for your ideal self. I genuinely hope that my internet rantings can help you realize that you already are the person you're supposed to be. I personally have invested thousands of dollars into improving myself and learning new skills, and I've really only just learned that I matter, that I'm lovable, I don't need to change to be worthy. But I also like having a cool life doing music, doing stand-up comedy, writing books, doing MMA and Jiu-Jitsu, working on my creative business ideas, and helping people find themselves and work out their purpose. And all of those things require ongoing education and practice and revision, and I will continue to invest time and money to be the person that I want to be. So it's not that there's anything wrong with me, I just feel like I'm living my purpose when I continue to invest in these things to be my ideal self. The distinction is, I'm not doing any of these things to impress my parents, my friends, whoever. I do these things because they satisfy my needs, and the expectations versus disappointment thing is not a part of the reasons I do any of them. And I want this for you. Back in my late teens, I suffered from crippling depression and then anxiety. And I self-medicated depression with drugs and alcohol, and lots of coffee and cigarettes. But the anxiety really stopped me from taking action and taking care of my responsibilities. I failed year 12 from being too afraid to leave the house and I developed irritable bowel, which the doctor said was from doing drugs, but I honestly believe it was more the anxiety and the moods and the mindsets that were related to what happened day to day. The anxiety in my body really spoke to me and I felt I was constantly in a power struggle with the thoughts that came from it and the debilitating feelings. Here are some of the thoughts that seem pretty common for me and for people I've spoken to about their anxiety and social anxiety, and we'll tackle these questions later in the presentation. What if? What if I have an episode or a panic attack? What if someone messes me up? What if I can't cope and I wanna go home and I get stuck? What if I can't perform due to anxiety? What if people think I'm being weird? 
What if something bad happens that I have no control over? I'm going to give you some mindset shifts later in this video, and hopefully you can reinforce them in your own mind with your own language, and that'll relieve some of the stress and help you develop a mindset that overcomes the feelings that stop you from being your ideal self and getting things done to be where and who you want to be. But to this point, I have to ask, would you do whatever is necessary to beat this thing finally? How much is it costing you financially, emotionally, physically, per year, per week, per day? How much is it slowing you down from achieving that ideal self and ideal life? You've probably tried a whole lot of things. Therapy, medication, meditation, and it feels like you've tried everything. But the truth is, people beat anxiety all the time. So you just haven't figured out what works for you specifically. If I told you the things that worked for the most people, would you actually do them? This program is not for people looking for a quick fix or a magic pill. This program is not for people who cannot do things consistently. This program is not for people who think they can think their way out. This program is not for people who cannot take responsibility and feel that it's everyone else's fault and that their greatness has not been realized. This program is not for people who cannot see the benefit in being organized or being on top of things. This program is not for people who identify with their trauma, being damaged, being the victim, being the wounded soul. If you really identify with any of these and aren't willing to challenge certain beliefs, then maybe this isn't for you. I don't need to waste your time trying to convince you. Here's a different what if. What if it went away? I want you to just take 30 seconds to close your eyes and visualize what your life might be like without this crippling anxiety or anxiety slash depression slash overwhelm. What's the life you'd be living if you were your ideal self? The process of imagining and then getting a sense of the outcome is the thing that people miss about the law of attraction. The subconscious mind follows emotions and makes subtle changes to your operating system based on moving towards pleasure or away from pain. If you're pain focused, your subconscious will just make moves based on that emotional prerogative. It's why positive psychology has shown so much promise in the last 20 years and things like NLP and gratitude are effective methods and show data to support this. This is also why mindfulness has become so popular and academically acclaimed in that there's data to show that it genuinely affects mental health conditions for the better. So yes, there's some relief in having an epiphany, one that gives you that aha moment and you feel smarter and enlightened. We often get excited that we can think our way into epiphanies that relieve hang-ups, but there's not a lot of scientific data to support epiphany-based recovery from mental or physical conditions. That's an experiential fallacy. Like when we tell ourselves that the other bus comes, that means mine is coming soon. It's a fun game to play with yourself. However, if you search Google Scholar on gratitude or mindfulness, there'll be dozens of articles that show effectiveness, and treatment of different disorders and diseases. Because the subconscious is powerful. That's why vision boards are popular. You're reinforcing the emotions that go with the outcome and the subconscious moves towards emotions. So when you believe it and feel the outcome, you'll take little opportunities that you might not notice from a fear-based mindset. So we're gonna attack this actually with a two-pronged approach. We'll process some of the limiting beliefs and traumatic events and shed some light on old patterns 
but you actually need to visualize your future and what you do want and how that feels. Otherwise, you can just drift around aimlessly and that will still give you depression. Will you go into the darkness and lift out the roots and examine the seeds? Will you engage in wellness practices to make yourself feel good every day? Will you admit that your diet could be better? Your finances could be better? Save more. Exercise more. Be nicer to people, even when you feel like being a jerk. Because if it was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You'd have worked it out by now. But it's a long, hard road out of hell. And you have to admit to yourself that you do have the strength to go as far as is necessary. Because all of the willpower you're wasting on staying where you are, that's a strong person. To endure the suffering of the human condition, you're tough, you're brave. To keep getting up and fighting every day, why don't we fight it with some stuff that's worked before? Because from this presentation alone, you will see why some of the things you've tried don't work for people. Okay, so I mentioned I struggled with this stuff myself, and I've come out the other side to be my ideal self and live the life I designed. And whilst I tried a lot of things and settled on the modalities that worked for me, I've also treated a lot of people with the stuff that I know because I love doing this. My whole life I've asked people what makes them tick and what they wanted to be and been a friend and a psychologist life coach to whoever needed me. I've studied and learned from experience how to actualize people and teach them how to walk through the valley of darkness to be who they want to be. And I've done it with several techniques and modalities and I will continue to learn more and more to make it easier, particularly for people like you, because you are people like me. I'm qualified to help you, because if you're watching this right now, I am like you. I've been where you are. And also, here's a bunch of my qualifications. You can book appointments at confidenceking.com.au. So there's some testimonials from people I've worked with. You can see more over at Z Talks on YouTube. Uh, the link for my Z Talks is on michaelzuper.com.au. Make it easy for you. will not guarantee results, especially if you are not ready to let go of the identity of being wounded or a victim, then I can't help you. This is what we call a secondary payoff, and it means you don't want to change because staying the way you are is giving you a payoff. It might seem like you're in a bad situation or you don't like how you feel or what's happening, but there's a payoff that's more subtle, that's actually more beneficial to you than changing your situation. And I can't help you if you're too afraid to face yourself, feel your feelings, and discuss your past in order to leave it in the past. To create a future, we need to accept the past. As I said before about acceptance, there's a good acceptance, as in, okay, let's move on. The bad acceptance is what's called learned helplessness in psychology, which is when you give up because you always fail. There was a study by Martin Seligman and Stephen F. Meyer. They performed shocks on dogs. Back then there wasn't PETA or vegan activism. But they used a sound that informed the dogs that they were about to be shocked. And if the dogs pushed a button with their nose, it alleviated the shock. If they jumped over a small wall... It alleviated the shock. But a roof put on the box stopped them jumping over the wall or they had harnesses to stop them pressing the button. The dogs that gave up in the first condition wouldn't try to jump or push the button or whatever because they had learned that nothing saved them. They learned that their behavior didn't alleviate the shock. Even though it was different now, 
even with the roof taken off so they could jump over the fence or the harness removed. They just learned to accept their fate. Something I'm going to talk about shortly. Irrelevant survival mechanisms. Things might have changed, but your internal beliefs and experiential decisions have stayed the same. If you are motivated to be somebody, excited about achieving and boosting your self-confidence and self-esteem, health conscious, willing to learn and implement, curious about the possibilities, then keep watching. A quote from me, which is slightly self-indulgent to me, but seriously, if I can do it, you can do it. So now, without further ado, how to go out in public and get things done without having an episode. Dr. Masaru Emoto did a study on water crystals. They actually go over this extensively in What the Bleep Do We Know, which is a documentary about quantum physics. Download that, seriously. So by freezing water crystals and using microscopic photography, Masaru Emoto found that not only do thoughts change the structure of water, prayer changed the structure of water, as you can see down the bottom. In What the Bleep, it shows one of the crystal formations as blessed by a Buddhist monk. Undoubtedly obvious is that harmony and balance comes with positive thoughts and vibrations, like prayer, gratitude, and mindfulness practices. This is why I'm going to give you some mindset shifts for the questions we posed earlier. You can find affirmations on YouTube. I recommend Dauxy Meditations. D-A-U-C-H-S-Y. Dauxy Meditations. And particularly the self-love meditations. But there's confidence, abundance, health, all kinds. So I want you to feel the emotional context, the energy of the counter-argument. What if I have an episode of panic attack? What if I don't? What if someone messes me up? What if someone builds me up? What if I can't cope and I want to go home and I get stuck? Eject. Have an ejection plan. What if I can't perform due to anxiety? What would stack the deck in my favour? What if people think I'm being weird? What if people like my weird? What if something bad happens that I have no control over? It will. Things undoubtedly will happen that you have no control over. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. What if something good happens? How does that feel? Remember the feeling. Remember, the water crystals, humans are 90% made of water. What if something good happens? Why do we have a negativity bias? Humans are designed to be avoidant. We're designed to avoid snakes, tigers, bears, things trying to kill us, things falling on top of us. The truth is, anxiety is a misfiring. By imagining with our mind, we trigger a fear response in our body to run away from something dangerous that's trying to kill us when there isn't. You're triggering yourself with your imagination. The first thing I want you to take away from this is positive reframing. The silver lining. It's a skill. It's the harder version of gratitude. We're born with a negativity bias. I want you to practice and develop a positivity bias. It's amazingly good for you. Imagine if every time a negative thought came in, you just made it positive. It's a superpower. Imagine every crystal in your body becoming positive because you just get good at this one thing. The next thing that can affect our ability to socialize is codependency. Something like 80% of people have traits of codependency. People-pleaser, fear of rejection, low self-worth, 
a night below. What is codependency? It can show up as dysfunctional relationships, excessive emotional or psychological reliance on partners, repressing emotions and focusing on other people's, manipulating or controlling because of a learned helplessness in directly asking or expressing. Survival mechanisms usually learned in childhood, as I was saying, irrelevant survival mechanisms. Kathleen Prouty said that individuals treated for codependency tend to have low self-esteem, self-deprecation, stress, rebellion and anger, depression and high dependency, mistrust in others and limited ego strength. Treatment for codependency recovery can include long periods of therapy or going to support groups such as Codependence Anonymous, cognitive behavioural therapy, being mindfulness of your own feelings, healthy boundaries, shame and acceptance. I'd recommend the work of Pia Melody and Melody Beattie. It's kind of adorable that they have similar names, but uh, Pia Melody's with a double L and Melody Beattie's with one. Another cause and element of codependency is attachment styles. So the way that we relate to our parents in childhood pretty much governs how we relate to everyone forever. So if your primary caregiver was very attendant, then you expect people to care about you and respond to your needs. If they didn't always respond to your needs, you kind of don't trust people as much. Or if you were met with a lot of hostility, then you just kind of don't need people. Now, something that's really interesting is people who are very needy seem to be attracted to people who are not needy at all, and vice versa. So we end up in these dynamics where someone's very needy and someone's completely avoidant. And that's often mistaken as the empath-narcissist dynamic, which is so popular right now. It's actually just both people trying to feel safe according to what they learned in childhood. Irrelevant survival mechanisms. Now, the other thing that's important is having healthy boundaries. Now, that might just sound like gibberish to you, but let me explain what I mean by that. If something makes you uncomfortable or hurts you, you need to explain it to the person who's doing that behavior around you. Now, the subtlety is there will always be some kind of squirm or pushback because basically you're limiting someone's freedom by trying to tell them to change their behavior, right? My advice to you is expect the pushback. I call it the squirm. So how this plays out is you state your boundary. That makes me feel uncomfortable. They squirm. Yeah, but are you sure you're not being too sensitive? And can I just not change what I'm doing? Because that would mean that I have to concentrate. And then you just say again, restating the boundary at the same level, not louder, not more aggressively, not bursting into tears. That makes me uncomfortable. And most often people just go, okay, that squirm and that pushback is actually just them clarifying, are you sure you need me to change my behavior? And it's natural. It's a natural thing for someone to test the limits of the boundary that you've set. Stick to your guns. The other way codependency plays out is in this kind of dynamic of the drama triangle. I actually wrote an article about this on Elephant Journal in 2015. It's called the Relationship Drama Triangle. So the obvious one is the enabling rescuer. When we're people pleasers, it's easy to put your needs lower than someone else's and possibly just because of where you lived in a family environment that you felt like you were the least important member of the family your needs were not often taken seriously by others, so you became the big brother, the big sister, or mum's confidant, or dad's little helper. But your needs became less important than others, so you just started to enable others, and it's just become a part of who you are. It's an irrelevant survival mechanism. However, the aggressor is codependent too. Controlling another person to feel safe means that you need another person to control in order to feel safe, because it affects you. So, if you feel guilt about hurting people or things you've said and done in the past, it's actually just a part of this disease that 80% of people have some traits of. And I'm not saying that abusers should get a pass, that their behavior is not under their control, but this is something that I teach kids in martial arts. If you feel like annoying your brother or sister and they attack you, whose fault is it? It's a trick question.
both of you. You're both at fault. The person attacking is problematic and the person counter-attacking is problematic. Both of you are at fault. If you can disrupt the urge to annoy your brother or sister, you win. If you can disrupt the urge to get petty revenge, you win. Otherwise, it's lose-lose. And obviously in the last few years, we've seen the prevalence of victimhood on social media. There is a great power in forcing your feelings to be validated onto somebody else. And again, codependency requires a counterpart. It's hard to be a victim on your own. If you're still watching this, there's a good chance we're a good fit for each other. Some martial artists are great fighters and not good teachers. Some martial artists are great teachers and not good competitors. Some teachers have the same teaching style as your learning style. If we're a good fit for each other, can I tell you about what I do and you can consider booking in a strategy call at the end of this video? I mean, if you agree, this has been informative and obviously you can't cover everything in a short video, but I assure you everything you need to know is available from me. I've beaten this myself. I can show you how. I will cater according to your specific needs because not one size fits all and you'll be rewarded for acting fast. The main thing is this, what's the outcome for you? Like I said before, how does that feel? What's your definition of success? What's the ideal life of the ideal self? Is it love? Is it money? Is it purpose? What is it worth for you to stop playing small, self-sabotaging, avoiding things, letting the anxiety tell you to stay home, letting the depression keep you in bed? What if you developed a cognitive bias to focus on what you do want? The tricky brain. So first of all, the instinctive brain the reptile brain, the amygdala, responsible for breathing and moving, basic functions. It also houses the threat system, so that's fear, anger, fight or flight, or freeze. In the Chinese system, we talk about paralysis or paralyzed will, but the fight, flight or freeze system is a function of the reptile brain. Next we have the emotional brain, the mammalian brain. Our monkey brain is responsible for the drive system, success. It's in the nucleus accumbens of the limbic system and it's responsible for wanting, pursuing and achieving. Part of the reason that we can't think rationally when we are triggered is because that fight or flight system is in the reptile brain and it does not communicate well with the monkey brain. Monkeys have complex hierarchies in relationships. Lizards do not. They fight or they run. Now, mature human thinking, which escapes us sometimes, occurs in the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for complex learning. Now, anxiety is often a function of the prefrontal cortex, i.e. the homo sapiens superhuman potential brain. When we overthink about the future and imagine something that might be a threat, we can trigger our fight or flight system. So adrenaline and sweat, dilated pupils, the perfect conditions to run away from a serious threat, but we trigger it with our own imagination. Or when we ruminate too much on the past and fail to have a creative epiphany, we can become depressed too. If these habits become chronic, so do the feelings. So as an introvert who spends a lot of time alone, we can create the perfect environment to overthink and to trigger our reptile brains. Somatic memory. The mammalian brain is responsible for episodic experience and creates kind of a general knowledge, semantic memory. When we have a certain amount of episodes where the same thing happens, we start to file that into the physical body. Somatic memory is generally associated with muscles and fascia, but it's along the same vein of the water crystals storing thoughts and feelings. 
I'm going to come back to talking about this in terms of glands and how our glands can become conditioned to release hormones or emotions. In the Chinese system, they also talk about this in terms of organs. So this is where the learned helplessness and negative assumptions can start to occur and get taken for granted. You boil a kettle every day, you just assume it'll whistle and have hot water in it. It just becomes a given. The issue is when you take the lid off the box and the dog doesn't even try to jump over the wall. The fear response stops giving you the resources to act as the body doesn't generate the fear, the flight response. The adrenal gland doesn't fire at all. The other time that the human to mammalian to lizard brain connection causes a lot of problems is when we think that what someone says relates to our past trauma. In relating what they said or did to our past fears, we can make an assumption that they will do something, a betrayal, in the future, that will be a problem so that again triggers our fight or flight response. This can cause a lot of conflict in relationships when one person tries to explain to the other how they're struggling with triggering themselves and the recipient is trying to reassure them, but then they get triggered that they are being accused of that assumption, the betrayal. In defending or interpreting the self-trigger as a hostile accusation, this can cause a counter-trigger and a conflict. Both people in their lizard brain trying to act like a human. The goal to avoid this is to recognize when you're triggered and disconnect until you can self-soothe, regulate your system until your prefrontal cortex turns back on and you're able to speak logically. Or if you're stuck in a car, ask them to be quiet so you can self-regulate. And if they don't understand, you can just say, I just feel unsafe and I'm liable to get hysterical and start an argument if I don't let my heart rate slow down. If you can identify that you've been triggered within the first 90 seconds, you can usually use a mindfulness technique to calm yourself down. Close your eyes. Sit in silence. Visualize the feelings in your body. What colors, what shapes, what textures do you see? And just observe the emotions with detached awareness. Just watch them and breathe. Don't try to change them, just breathe. If you don't catch it in the first 90 seconds, your brain starts to download the mindset of that particular emotion of that mood. And that keeps you in that mood as the thoughts associated with that mood start to come through your brain. So your fear gets triggered and then you have heaps of paranoid thoughts and that keeps you in a fear state. Or your anger is triggered and you start thinking about injustice and oppression and things that frustrate you. The mindset perpetuates the state and then it takes longer for your body to metabolize that particular hormone. So the glands can misfire at imaginary danger. Or maybe they don't fire at all in the case of learned helplessness. And the adrenal gland stops going, jump, jump, and the dog doesn't try because there's no flight message from the body anymore. It's common knowledge in many schools of Tantra that the chakra system from the Vedas, yoga scriptures, corresponds with the endocrine system. The glands line up with the traditional chakras, the energy centers of the body. So the ancient system, which was basically built on trial and error, reached the same conclusions as modern medical science. This is also similar to the Chinese medicine system, which is the fire, earth, metal, water, and how that operates in the body. The chakra system is also similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs in that you sort of have to resolve one set of problems before you level up and take on another level of problems. For example, you're not really trying to find a loving partner that's on your level or realize your purpose in life when you're homeless and you don't know where your next meal is coming from. You need that level one safety, your survival needs satisfied, before you start moving on to social needs and social pressures and fitting into the tribe. So part of the process that I take my coaching clients through involves using the traditional Chinese medicine system to clear trauma from the traditional chakra system. So, somatic memory from the glands, basically. Using applied kinesiology, we test for the element and then rub the corresponding meridian points, as you can see on the chart here. And that basically relaxes the body where the somatic memory, that trauma, is stored. 
When we talk about the things that are causing the anxiety and then rub the meridians, it relaxes those triggers in the body. And then we do some cognitive reframing to start creating a new neural pathway in the brain. I might even give you a little homework to practice mindfulness or start living the life of your ideal self and see how it feels without the fear and sabotage. Okay, so back to the crystals. If you don't book a call with me, at least you can walk away with the reframing and silver lining techniques, do your YouTube affirmations, the mindfulness meditation, that's detached awareness and visualizing your internal state without pushing it in any way. Remember, this is about observing and not changing the emotions. In this way, you will react less to things and people. It's like a song on the radio or a car going past. You just go, oh, okay. You don't even think there's a car going past or what should I do about the car going past? This is really important for those with codependency issues and having boundaries with other people and their emotions. You want it all to just be like a car going past. Okay, last thing. I really want to reiterate what I said at the start. There's nothing wrong with anyone and we already are the person that we want to be. It's just that life can kind of condition us into that learned helplessness or do you associate certain things? And that's what I meant when I said irrelevant survival mechanisms. You grow up in a house where you have to tiptoe to the toilet in the middle of the night because your parents or siblings yelled at you for waking them up. No part of us goes, oh, I don't have to do that anymore when you move out. So you're forever tiptoeing to the toilet because that's just how you learn to survive. And sometimes that shows up as people pleasing and codependency and being overly humble with your needs and always enabling other people's emotions and desires and it's just exhausting because you burn yourself out giving other people what you think they need and resenting it because you never really ask for what you need. If you're ready to get this handled once and for all, it's time to talk about booking a strategy call. Who is a strategy call for? Someone who's motivated to take action and finally overcome somatic memory in the nervous system. Someone who's committed to doing whatever it takes to change to be supported and also unsupervised in their own time. Someone willing to follow instructions and it's for the brave. Strategy call is not for someone who is still looking and not ready to commit to a course of action, not ready to invest time and money and effort in themselves. It's not for someone who complains or blames or doesn't see a correlation between bad attitude and feeling bad. It's also not for someone who just wants to get me on the phone for something to do. Alright, so i got six spots open, otherwise you might have to wait for the next round, which might take up to three months and you might slip through the cracks. So don't hesitate. If you're ready to get over this, book your strategy call now. Otherwise, it might not happen. That's all, folks. Um, I hope you wrote down a few things and you took away some of the techniques and had a few little mindset shifts and epiphanies to make you feel better right now. But otherwise, you know what to do. Book your strategy call. Email talksz at gmail.com and follow me on YouTube and Facebook for free information. And if you don't, well, I hope you learned something from the presentation.